Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, as Rodrigo mentioned, uh, lead all our startup and investor engagement across all of Europe, including our startup program for the cloud organization. So what does that mean? It means that effectively I spend all my day trying to figure out how do we support teams, how do we support founders as they're looking to kind of build out their infrastructure and applications, but as they are looking to also adopt and build out machine learning capabilities and what does that mean and how does that happen? Um, you know, it's you know, very, very easy to kind of say that, hey, we are going to be an AI company, uh, but you know, what does that actually mean? I mean, these days it can be said that really, when it comes down to it, that starting a company has never been easier from a barrier of entry standpoint, but there's a lot more input, a lot more decisions to be made. And that can be synonymous with being a lot of noise and confusing. Um, there's many of the experts out there. Uh, but then how do you kind of synthesize all those data points and what does that become? I think it's uh, quite clear that over the last, you know, maybe about three or four years ago, that uh, every pitch deck that I saw said big data. Um, and now everyone has kind of fast forward and control find and replace big data with AI and ML, machine learning. But is it a phenomenon? No, I mean, it's all for good reason. I mean, what the reality is AI has been around, conversation at least, since the 50s. It's not new. The biggest difference is computing power has now caught up. And now a lot of the things that we've dreamed about and talked about and pontificated about are now starting to become a reality. Um, so those are, those are the things that we know, right? Those are some of the truths. But it's also kind of started us down this path of people that want to have AI and machine learning at the core of their product or service that they're building, that it's created a new set of problems. Right now there's a massive talent war that exists out there. If you think about and take as truth that there's 21 million professional coders in the world, and then how many of those are deep learning engineers? And then when you kind of take it a step further and think about the large behemoths, your Googles and Facebooks that can afford to hire them, then how many are left for the rest of the world to be able to hire? So it's starting to cause a lot of these kind of philosophical kind of conversations around, hey, we've always had our tech team uh, be very centralized, everybody together, but now we need to think about becoming much more decentralized and just hire the best people wherever they are. And that's starting to become much more the norm. But then it's also where you see a whole new wave of startups that are being built, uh, building, say, like HR type of solutions, uh, because they're trying to get more insight into what is it that our current employees are telling us? How do we retain them? So Pecan, uh, a startup, uh, a Danish one, um, they're a very good example of that in, some, in what they provide. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these large enterprises, your customers, they're trying to figure out, you know, well, if we can't innovate as quickly, then how do we try and delight our employees and create a better experience? So you see a lot of these that are starting to be built. But then it goes to always around users and revenue, right? I mean, internally, we talk quite a bit of, and put a lot of emphasis and effort into how do we attract the next billion users? What does that mean? How do you do that? And a lot of that is just kind of synonymous with kind of trying to delight the customer and using data. It's all about the insights. And that's what a lot of companies are being predicated on today. And you know, kind of to tie it all together is that you know, if cash was king, data is the new king. And you know, if you think about kind of the evolution of where we've come from uh, and where we're going, you know, all this kind of AI and ML talk, really, all that means is that's code for data. That's, that's what it's all about. And you start seeing a lot more companies that are maybe not wanting to take the approach of building general AI companies. Uh, why? Because uh, that can maybe automatically pit them against some of the big, the big large organizations. But you start seeing people going down the path of building more niche, um, kind of sector-specific AI type of companies. Why? Well, yeah, a lot it has to do with about the, the data sets, proprietary data, the more proprietary, uh, perhaps uh, the more clean it might be, and then you might be able to train your models that much better, but then obviously that can give you a distinct advantage against others uh, that you're going against. Um, 
and then and then I think there's also that obviously if you can the better you can train those models then the better quality output of product that you're going to be putting out there you know when the first kind of SaaS companies started kind of coming online it was kind of simplistic and we only had a few data points that we needed to kind of think about and you know you kind of went to those religiously and tried to always kind of create little efficiencies here and there and trying to understand things but now life's become way more complicated right um, we want to know everything about them uh, we want to be able to to figure out all their tendencies we want to create predictive behaviors so that way we can figure out ways that we can delight the user and the customer. Um, so all of a sudden, you see a lot of organizations building data science teams, or you see startups that are being created uh, where their single purpose and what their value proposition is around providing analytics to large organizations. And you know, that is a wonderful thing, eh, because it's a whole new wave of companies that are being built. But one thing I would caution is that it's very easy to kind of jump through and go down that rabbit hole of, hey, we're going to build out machine learning capabilities. We're going to hire people with PhDs. But you know, re there, there is a dose of reality that comes with making that decision. And some of that is that, well, you know, when it comes to machine learning, it is one of the few kind of areas and disciplines where having people that have the requisite knowledge and skill set and PhDs actually does tend to come in handy. But Hiring those people can be very expensive, which impacts burn rate, or just trying to figure out how you find them in general can be exhausting and takes your eye off of kind of your overall product and what you're trying to do anyway. So I've seen many of companies that have incurred a lot of technical debt of kind of doing exactly that without really truly understanding their use case. Because I challenge most people that most use cases there's a lot of pre-trained APIs, pre-trained models that exist off the shelf that people can use. So I would urge people to kind of take a look at that because that might be a way to not have to hire a team of PhDs, but rather you can just have a lot of DevOps engineers being able to make API calls and be able to use it from that perspective. Now, if we are talking about, say, some of these pre-trained models and APIs that exist, Perhaps the most popular one I continually see from startups uh, ac across the globe and certainly within Europe is Vision API. So people are using it uh, quite a bit uh, to be able to, for object recognition, so OCR. So oftentimes you see people building companies around being able to detect brands and then being able to link it, say, maybe through natural language processing uh, to understand sentiment and what are people saying about your products and being able to use it from a visualization standpoint. So it's a very powerful thing. Uh, for us, from a Vision API perspective, it's what powers Google Photos. So hopefully many of you have been able to see that and it's been a delightful experience for you. But it's definitely one of the more popular things you see out there. And I thought it'd be good to kind of show a use case of a Berlin-based startup, uh, Nyris, that uh, they, are, they are using OCR as pretty much core to their product in what they're able to do by being able to take pictures, being able to link it um, to, the, to the products and people can put it in their cart. So they're partnering with people like large brands like Target uh, to try and make the overall user experience that much better. But cool stuff that they're doing. Now, of course, if, if having the pre-trained models and APIs is something that ultimately isn't going to work for you because your use case requires something much more bespoke and training your own models, then you know, I, I, I think that I'm a firm believer in kind of open source community. Uh, but uh, Thomas uh, Tungs from, uh, from Redpoint, um, he, he writes wonderful blogs. And uh, one of the things that he talks about is kind of surrounding yourself with people that are building ecosystems, people that are the power of the community. So I'm a big believer in that. Now, you know, full transparency, TensorFlow is a Google project. Uh, but I'm quite proud of, you know, when you think about the top two open source projects on GitHub, it's, they are Google projects, uh, maybe by coincidence, maybe not, uh, but uh, TensorFlow and Kubernetes. But with TensorFlow, what's beautiful is just that power of the community that's really accelerating the development and people being able to really kind of use that as a movement 
to band together uh, because you know machine learning, well, the conversation has existed for ages. It's still very new and kind of from a very applied perspective. So it's great that you have something out there that does exist. So I'd say that it is something that could, could be viewed upon as favorable. Now, if you are continuing down that path of building your own models, then the top two questions without fail that I always get are, hey, how do we get our hands on data sets? And how do we, how do we find these people that can do it? Because machine learning, in effect, is a lot of complex mass. And then you got to figure out how to build the back end infrastructure and how do you get them to meet? And that's a very hard thing to do, right? So how do you find those people? I talked about it earlier. So Kaggle's really cool because it's effectively like a marketplace for data scientists. So I always tell startups, you know, post the competition on there because it's effectively what most people do. They'll post data science competitions. Post the competition on there and the people that can help solve the problems, go, f go hire them. It's a great recruiting tool. I've seen many, many people uh, hire through that, through that medium. Um, and then on top of that, um, it's also cool because people are posting new data sets all the time. And then of course there are other uh, good ways to get data sets like the Open Data Institute from Tim Berners-Lee. It's also a very great way as well. Um, I thought it would be good to also showcase and highlight a startup that is building their own machine learning models just because I think it's pretty cool in how they go about it. They are um, effectively, through uh, their machine learning and algorithms, able to catch credit card fraudsters. So uh, Ravelin is based in London, so I'm gonna play a video just because I think it's pretty cool just to kind of hear them talk about what they're doing. In addition to using machine learning to <coughs> catch fraudsters, we use something called network graph analysis. And on screen, you'll see a really simple network. It consists of a single person and a single credit card. Now, don't be fooled by that cute smiling face. That's actually a fraudster, and it's a stolen credit card. And if there was another fraudster who used the same card, you'd see them all linked together as well. So this is just a more complex version of what you saw previously, just with many more cards and many more fraudsters all linked together. And I think it looks pretty beautiful. And what you're looking at here is an organized crime ring. In this particular case, we worked with the police and we gathered enough evidence and we were able to put a stop to the entire network. And we're particularly proud of this because it's a great feeling knowing that the technology we built helped put a stop to professional criminals. And this was the height of our achievement until we came across this network. Internally, we call this the Death Star. <laughs> there are tens of thousands of nodes. And the most awesome thing about networks of this size is that when our machine learning model catches a single fraudster, because they're all connected in a network, we can put a stop to thousands of accounts instantly. So, uh... Give it up for Lenny Austin, CTO and co-founder of Ravelin. Um, wonderful job that he and the team are doing, uh, but really cool in how they're using in a real life case of applying machine learning to a real world problem. So kind of in closing, uh, I think I'd leave you with this. You know, when it comes to kind of machine learning and AI, it is the hype, uh, no doubt, and I'm a firm believer it will be very much a part of the fabric of every company kind of being built going forward in one way or another. But I urge people to make sure that ultimately they are doing it for the right reasons. Not for some aqua hire, not to raise some crazy valuation, because really that's gonna be setting yourself up for failure. I've seen it many of times. Do it because ultimately you wanna become a category leader or you want to build a new category or change and improve humanity. 
do it for those reasons, because that's what's ultimately going to matter, and that's where the passion will permeate throughout. And kind of last but not least, you know, many of you entrepreneurs, you'll be called many things in your journey and in your time. Um, but the reality is that you are building what's next. You are going to change the world. So I applaud you. And certainly if there's anything that we can do to help you on that journey, by all means, let me know. So um, I want to thank you. And uh, next, next up, we are going to kind of move and um, Les Hazelwood, uh, founder and CTO of Stormpath, who brought to market an API-first approach to identity management. Earlier this year, <clears throat> Okta, the leading provider of single sign-on solutions, acquired Stormpath and Les joined them as a senior architect. So please raise your hands for Les. Thank you.